Well, not that he could ever really be great, you understand. Oh, is that so? And in the name of St. Bridget, why not? Well, all of the really great cornet players were Irish. You shouldn't hang me on a hook. My father hung me on a hook once. Once. A, B, C. A, always, B, B, C, closing. Always be closing. Always be closing. Hey, how are you? Mark here, back with another thrilling episode of The Cinemaniacs. I am The Cinemaniac, you are a Cinemaniac. Together we are the titular Cinemaniacs. Uh, it's been a week. Uh, <laughs> has it been a week? Uh, I've been away uh, as a guest of the state, and now I've escaped to talk to you a little bit more about some flicks I've seen. I haven't seen everything, sorry. It's gonna be not a breathless show, it'll be a very manageable show, more than we have been lately, more than three shows, three films to talk about, but uh, I haven't seen everything that's out in the theater because I've chose to pursue other endeavors. But we have eight to talk about today. Nice round number, round on top, round on the bottom. And uh, we will start with the latest, it's, what's, it's what everybody's playing this week. It's the new uh, edition, it's the new, uh, I don't wanna say any word that's in the title, it's the new installment of everybody's favorite killer clown movie that isn't Killer Clowns from Outer Space and isn't that TV movie this, uh, that beat this movie to the punch. Uh, it is the uh, saga, ongoing saga, of some kids in Derry, Maine who came across an evil, oh yeah, Facebook. So guess what? We're on Facebook right now. We're on Facebook Live. Uh, basically, we do this live. As I'm seeing this, people on Facebook are watching it. And if you're watching it any time other than right now, uh, you missed it. And you're watching it recorded to Facebook. So if you have any comments you want to leave, I can't read them because I'm talking right now. But we are on Facebook Live. That's the URL. That's where we do this show every week. And then it stays there so you can see the entire episode with the trailers and with whatever clips I use that I have to cut out on YouTube because they get copyright flagged. And then I have to cut them out anyway. So we will uh, continue to post things. Uh, new upcoming screenings, new events, sales opinions, additional reviews, whatever, on the Facebook page for this very fine program. So anyway, what was I talking about? I think I was talking over here, sorry. It's been a week. You'd think I'd remember how to do this. So, the latest chapter in the saga of these kids in Derry, Maine who went up against an evil clown and survived because they killed the clown, but wait, things are happening again. So as adults, they all come back to fight it, chapter two. So basically you have It, which is originally a novel by Stephen King, and it was about, it was the size of a nice huge dictionary. It was huge, it was a big book. At the time when I saw people reading it, when it came out, I couldn't believe a book with a story in it could be that big. Anyway, uh, it was split between two films. The original uh, televisual presentation of this was, a, I think it was a two-part TV movie back in 1990, which I watched originally and thought was pretty creepy, except for the end, and now this is a big budget, higher caliber, theoretically higher caliber, everything going into telling the story again with uh, a bit more resources behind it. So uh, it, not called it chapter one when it came out, by the way, some people didn't quite know going into it, literally, that they weren't getting an ending on their film. I mean, it kind of has an ending, but there's, you know, more to go. Um, the original book jumps back and forth in time, it takes place with adults reflecting back upon their youth and all that. They sort of wisely chose to make the first film, I think, Linear. So the first one was about the kids and this bad thing happens and this evil clown shows up and starts taking children into the sewers and other places and they have to try to band together and figure out a way to stop it. This film picks up, It Chapter 2 picks up 27 years later uh, with all of those kids now grown up as adults and it's happening again. Murders are happening again in this town and they get back together. They said they vowed if it ever happened again they would get together and try to make sure it didn't continue. So it's them coming back and trying to remember what happened because apparently the story of the film is once you leave this evil place, this town, you forget what had happened there until you come back and then all the memories come back to you. So they all get back together, uh, they get to know each other again, and they try to figure out a way to stop the evil clown from you know taking the children of Derry once more. Um, for those who really loved the first film and really loved the interplay with the kids and the child actors, there's a good amount of that in here too. There are a lot of flashbacks and content that I believe was not 
in the first film. I don't remember the first film terribly well. Um, the adult cast is, is quite good. You, only really recognizable people in it, name-wise, are Jessica Chastain and Bill Hader. Uh, very, very good in the film. Um, I didn't love the previous incarnation of it. I mean, I should say chapter one, if you want to call it that now. Um, I don't find CGI scary. I don't find special effects scary. I don't find loud noises scary. I always say if somebody jumps up behind you and says boo and you jump or scream, does it mean you thought it was scary or was that a physical reaction? Somebody tickles you and you laugh, does that mean you thought it was funny? I don't think so. So there's a lot of jump scares, there's a lot of loud noises, there's a lot of special effects or Pennywise the clown, his mouth opens real, real wide and it just looks, it just looks silly to me. So I didn't dig that about the first movie. The, what I loved about the first movie was the human element. The stuff with the kids. It was another Stand By Me or Stranger Things or whatever you want to call it. Kids on bikes relating to each other and trying to get by in the world. For me, the strength of It Chapter 2 was the same thing. It was a little bit more of that childhood uh, section of the story. And it was adults who haven't... Adults who were friends a long time ago getting back together and how do they interact now and how do they relate and how are they the same and how are they different? To me, that was fascinating. Perhaps it's the age at which I rest right now. Perhaps it's just, to me, that's more interesting than a CGI mouth that opens real wide with a lot of teeth in it. Um, the scary moments, the moments that were intended to be scary, let me backtrack. When the movie was trying to be funny, I thought it was very funny. It was a lot funnier than I expected and it had some really good laughs in it. When it was trying to be scary, I found it kind of funny and that's not good for me. Um, I found the special effects cheesy. I found some of the things that were supposed to be scary more laughable than anything else. Uh, the horror aspects of this just really didn't work for me personally. Um, I know a lot of people love the first part of this film, the first chapter, the first installment as it were. Um, I think a lot of those people would like the second. I can't imagine going to see this second part of the film if you haven't seen the first, just because it's a story already in progress. I mean, I think it is probably done well enough so that if you have a general idea about the film, it gives you enough of the backstory and you can kind of hit the ground running with this. Um, but I, I think you really want to see the first one before you see the second one. Now, you know me, I'm a drive-in kind of guy. And a lot of drive-ins actually have both films playing as a, as a pair. So you could go and see it immediately followed by It Chapter 2. It's really one long movie. It's really one movie that's split into two parts to necessitate not having a four-hour movie in theaters. So, uh, although this one is almost three hours as it is, be aware of that. It's Chapter 2 is long. So if you're thinking about going and seeing this at a 9.30 show, be aware that you're probably not getting out of that theater until after midnight. Um, so I thought, it, I thought it was fine, I guess. I can't really say I liked it because it's just, it's just not my bag. I mean, it had elements that I liked, but other elements just seemed unnecessary or kind of forced to me. So call me crazy. Many have, many do, but when I saw the original, I, I wasn't in love with the original It. It's not like I saw it at a certain age. I think I was 16 or something when I saw it. But there's a sequence in that, if I'm remembering it right, where somebody is in a park in broad daylight. It's a very lightly attended public park, and they look up and there's a clown holding a balloon there. And it's creepy because you know, and the character knows, that clown isn't supposed to be there. In this film, you see the clown show up, and instead of just being a clown standing there that's weird and unsettling, it's all <laughs> And to me, that's like, calm down. It's, it's like they're trying too hard. Like the Pennywise is so grotesque looking and weird and aggressively creepy, or walks all herky-jerky, which just looks silly. Or they do the thing that was in the teaser we ran, where this a little old lady from behind Jessica Chastain or off to the side is running back and forth real fast, and that just looks funny to me. Is it supposed to be scary? I don't know. Um, I think this is probably a film that will work much more for the Utes. I think, um, I don't know, when this ran at Keen Cinemas, when the first part ran at Keen Cinemas a year or three ago, the staff there was saying people were walking out because they couldn't handle how scary it was, or they thought it was the scariest movie they'd ever seen. My reaction was, you don't watch many scary movies now, do you? Uh, anyway, if it works for you, that's great. I'm happy if people pay money to see a film and they enjoy it. I got no fault with that. I got no beef with that. So uh, for me, it chapter two was not very interesting. But then again, I didn't think the first part was very interesting. I thought it was okay. I still wonder why these aren't released in October, but who am I to judge? Uh, up next, arguably the oldest, <laughs> the film that has been out the longest that I'm talking about. Like I said, I'm playing catch up and I'm still going to keep doing this. I'm going to keep trying to see things that are still in theaters that I missed opening weekends and eventually I'll get caught up. 
So, we have the third film in a series following special agent, special secret service agent, played by Gerard Butler, who in Olympus Has Fallen, he helped defend the president and the White House against a terrorist attack. In London Has Fallen, he helped defend the president and whoever else against terrorist attacks in London. In this film, he is once again trying to defend the president, and things get a little more complicated when Angel Has Fallen. I love our new TriCaster. That's what we use now to do the show. It's the switcher and computer and graphics and all that stuff. It's miles beyond what we used to use here. And it has fun little transitions like that. And I'm a sucker for the boom booms and the transitions. So, Angel Has Fallen. I was not looking forward to this. This, um, I really liked Olympus Has Fallen. It's not brilliant, but it was a fun kick-ass action movie at a time where I wasn't getting many of those. Then they did London Has Fallen, and I didn't like it. It was very shaky cam garbage, and I just, it was tedious for me. I'd really, and I was bummed because I liked the first one so much. So when a third one was announced and the trailer was splashed across the screen, I was like, ugh, I don't know. That last one wasn't very good. And this one looks like more of the same. And the whole idea, which would have been a great surprise in the movie, too late now, I think the, the word's out, but Nick Nolte is in this film. A very grizzled, haggard, uh, Grizzly Adams, mountain man looking, homeless looking Nick Nolte, and uh, he plays Gerard Butler's father. And stunt casting to a degree, and I'm, I'm never a fan of, you know, it worked great in Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade when Sean Connery showed up as Indiana Jones' father and made him humble and made him feel like a little kid and the interplay was great. But I've seen it again and again and again and it's usually a little forced to me, but Boy, did it work in this film. I really liked Angel Has Fallen a lot. It had me laughing and giggling and really, really into it. It was a kick-ass action movie again. And it's very, very funny at times. The stuff with Nick Nolte, <laughs> Nick Nolte is basically this guy who, who ran off and left Gerard Butler and his mother, uh, left his, Nick Nolte left his family many moons ago and uh, Butler tracks him down to hide out because the basic plot of this is Somebody attempts an assassination of the president, who's played by Morgan Freeman in this film, and uh, the president survives, but all signs point to Gerard Butler's character as being uh, the person who perpetrated it, and he has to go on the run. So he has the full power of the U.S. military and the bad guys who really did do it on his, on his trail, and he has to survive and sort of prove his innocence and stop another assassination attempt that's on the way. Um, and in doing so, he goes into the woods where his weird... Uh, off-the-grid father is living, and his off-the-grid father is ex-military too, and amazing things happen. Things that had me laughing and giggling aloud and loud and long. So yeah, uh, Angel Has Fallen was a hell of a good time. You have Butler, who's great in these roles. You have Nolte, who's really good at what he does in this. Uh, you have the bad guy, who I'm not going to name. You have Morgan Freeman, who's Morgan Freeman. All he has to show up and do is show up and, and be cool and talk, and, and he's cool. Although he's in a coma for most of the movie. Um, and I will say, the villains in this film were obvious, boom, from the get-go. As soon as I saw one character, I'm like, that's gonna be the bad guy. And as soon as I saw another character, and I'm like, that person's involved with this. But it didn't matter. You know, there was this big reveal. It wasn't a big reveal at all, but the path to getting there was so much fun. And I have to say, the action was well rendered. You could see what was going on. There's a little of the shaky garbage in it, but let me tell you, even if the movie was fun and funny, if it was all the shaky cam crap, I would have hated this, and I did not. I really, really liked this. This has been in theaters for a few weeks now. I don't know how much longer it's going to be around. I'm not sure that we have anything really big coming up for a few weeks, so this will probably linger, you know, moving to the smaller and smaller auditorium in your local multiplex. But I, I would say if you like action movies, even if you haven't seen the other films, this is very much worth seeing. If you have seen the other films, this is a great continuation of the story. They probably can keep making these things as long as Butler wants to and is physically able to, however much physical demands there are for anybody in, in a movie these days. Um, but yeah, Angel Has Fallen, it, uh, it made me very happy. Let's just say that. And I expected, maybe it made me so happy because I expected it would not. And when the, the expectations are so, so low, you get something that's adequate and you ju they jump up and you get something you think is really good. And it's, it's, it has leapt much taller, it has leapt a higher building than it would have if you thought it was gonna be great. Anyway, that's uh, Angel Has Fallen, that's out. Now, one more to go. This is one that, um, it's been out for a week or so. It's a horror comedy. 
It's a movie that when I saw this trailer that you're about to see, if you're watching on Facebook, if you're on YouTube, just type in this name and trailer and you'll see it. When I saw this trailer, I wasn't quite sure what to make of it. It didn't really look that great to me, but then I heard people saying how good it was. So it sort of buoyed, it sort of yeah buoyed my hopes. Did I ever tell you about the time I saw Flavor Flav on a plane? Did I tell you about the time I was on a plane back from Vegas and Flavor Flav was on the plane with the clock around his neck? If there's time at the end of the show, I'll bring that up. Anyway, this is a film about a young woman who marries into a family that is sort of, think of them as Parker Brothers. Think of them as Milton Bradley. She mar marries into a gaming dynasty family, very rich family, country estate, and they do this thing whenever anybody new comes into the family. They just play a little game. You pull a card out of a box and you play a game. And um, sometimes that game is hide and go seek. And when it's hide and go seek with this family, you hide and they try to kill you. Uh, it's not too cool if you pull that card. So this film is entitled Ready or Not. So I saw it. So I went and saw it on Saturday after this being out for several weeks and uh, me just dragging my butt to see it. And I didn't really care for it. Um, there was something about it. I'll detail it because we have 34 minutes left in the show. So the story is, you know, young happy bride meets, is ready to be married or just got married with the young happy husband and the family is kind of weird and quirky and it's a, this big country estate with a lot of dark wood and tall ceilings and doorways and cupboards and things and a dumb waiter. Uh, well, he seemed dim, maybe not dumb. And they play this game and she finds out that it's basically, it's this most dangerous game. They're trying to hunt and kill her. And if she survives until morning, she can become part of the family. And if she can't, well, uh, she doesn't. And uh, there's some other thing tied in about there's like a family curse or there's some thing where if the family doesn't do this, it means trouble for all of them. Um, you know, part of what it was, was the writing. I thought the writing was kind of not good. Uh, way too much profanity. And I don't do it on the show, but believe me, anybody who knows me does, knows that the tongue of a sailor lives in my mouth. That didn't quite sound right. I cuss a lot. That sounds better. It sounds more accurate. And the, uh, so there's so much swearing in it. I'm just like, really? Sometimes when there's too much in a movie, Tarantino is sometimes guilty of this. It just feels phony. It's like, yeah, I, I swear a lot. My friends swear a lot, but that just seems like you're written. That's written. And a lot of the dialogue seems very written. And a lot of the performances are very mannered and very not that great. Um, I didn't like the way it was shot either. It's very dark. It's very, very dark brown, dark, it's just, it's dim a lot of the time. And it's got the shaky crap going on whenever anything exciting happens and the aggressive editing. So it's hard to really see a lot of what's going on. There's a lot of violence. It's very gory at times, which some people dig. I don't, I don't mind it. Sometimes it can be very horrifying. Sometimes it can be very dramatic. Sometimes it can be very funny if you're sick like me. Um, but that just, it just seemed like it was trying too hard. The whole movie seemed like it was trying too hard to me. And I just didn't care. I didn't care about the characters. I thought everybody was just nasty. It had a really nasty tone to it. Uh, which, you know, a family of people trying to kill somebody else, they should be nasty. But even the protagonist I didn't care about, right? I didn't care about anybody in this movie. And it just, I, do, I was done well before the movie was done. Actually, as I saw the film wrapping up, I walked down from my stadium seat and I started walking backwards down the hallway <laughs> to, the, to the exit. So I'm like, okay, yup, 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 and credits, bye. I just couldn't wait to get out of there. I really did not like this. It was, something was very distasteful about it, and it wasn't the subject matter. It wasn't that it was profanity. It wasn't that people were being, you know, skewered through the eyeball with uh, crossbows. It was just something that was just kind of smarmily cynical about it that I didn't like. Um, it feels like the kind of story I've seen many times, and the premise is kind of dumb to me. You get, you bring, oh, somebody new is coming into the family, and hey, what we might kill you. Well, th what, nobody's gonna miss this person. Nobody knows they're getting, I guess the person, she's supposed to be an orphan or something, I don't know. Anyway, I, I shouldn't be thinking about that, by the way. It, sh it should be such a good film that I don't start questioning the logic in it. So I did not like Ready or Not, but uh, people I know and like and respect did like it and thought it was great. So again, that whole your mileage may vary thing. If it looks good to you, I'd say give it a shot. You're probably less demanding. <laughs> Probably less demanding than I am. Normal people, I think, are less demanding than I am. But uh, that's still in theaters. And again, that's been out a couple weeks. So I would say this one, like Angel Has Fallen, if you really want to see it, I would say try to see it this weekend because it probably won't be along much longer. What I see coming out this weekend in theaters is fairly light. So I think it's going to be a couple weeks. I think everybody is backing off because they know it is going to be popular for a few weeks. So I would say 
not this coming, but maybe the next weekend or the weekend after, you're gonna see some big releases coming in and it's gonna push out all of this sort of lower tier stuff or the stuff that's been around for a while. It may finally push Aladdin and Lion King out of theaters. Um, so that is all we have to talk about uh, in theaters that I saw that's new and theatrical. There's a whole lot more coming. There's two next weekend, which I'm sure I'll achieve, or at least one of. Uh, I'm gonna actually have an expert opinion next weekend on one of these. And I'm, I'm very excited to see it with this person. I'm very excited to report back because I've actually never been able to do this before. And uh, now we'll mention that we have an email address. Remember email? Remember Hotmail, Gmail, AOL? that kind of thing. Well, we still have one of those things here. So if you have a message to send us, or you have a question for me, or anything like that about the show, or the production of the show, or movies I mentioned, or movies that you like, or maybe you remember a fleeting something about a guy with an ostrich who could, you know, play, play the ponies really accurately back in 1963. Maybe I know what that title is and I can help you out. I don't know. It's just fun. It's fun to hear from anybody. It's fun to know that anybody's watching. So movies at CheshireTV.org is that address. That's always active. That's been active for years and it will remain active. So that's there if you care, you know. Um, now we will move on to that which is available on home video, home video, home viewing or backyard viewing if you have a projector in a white building that is next to your house. This is available on the service or platform or device or format or who knows what of your choice. Uh, first up is a movie I actually just talked about. This is still in theaters. This is out on video tomorrow. This is Monday that we're taping this on. Tuesday this is on video. This is still playing all over the place. This thing has been a juggernaut. This is Disney's live action remake of their animated classic, which co-starred Robin Williams way back when in the 90s. This is the tale of a young street urchin thief who meets and falls in love with a princess, but there's an evil wizard who also is in love with the princess, or he just wants this lamp in which is a genie who's never been a friend to anyone like this urchin person. And this, you may have heard of it in one form or another. It's called Aladdin. So un unlike Dumbo, uh, this film and The Lion King live action remake have been just powerhouses at the box office. They came out May? That, did that say May? It came out like in May, beginning of the summer, early, early summer, pre-summer, and it's been playing theaters ever since. It's been playing drive-ins still. Uh, st as of last weekend, it was still in places. Uh, so I saw the original Aladdin here in Keene at the Colonial Theater where that original film played for like a year or it played for an incredibly long time, back when The Colonial was still showing, you know, primarily feature films and first run stuff, mainstream stuff. And uh, it was great, you know? I'm, I'm not a gigantic Disney fan. I don't own any of them. I don't remember the words to the songs or anything like that, but I, I've seen most of them in the theater. And the original Aladdin was fantastic. And this movie coming along is basically the exact same thing, but with actors, with live action actors. It's funny to call these live action, especially the, the Lion King, to call them live action remakes because they're still animated. They're just CG animation, they're computer animation. They're not, they're not um, cell animation like Disney used to do. But this is you know live actors and then Will Smith as the genie is CGI enhanced a lot of the time. So they try to make him do some of the Robin Williams-y things from the original cartoon and give that look. But excuse me, he's not blue. And um, everybody in it is fine. Maybe with the exception of the actor who plays Jafar. Nothing against the actor, but he seemed too young for the role. He didn't seem menacing enough. He didn't seem, I don't know. Again, we're basing it on the animation. I had the same problem with the Lion King remake. With the Lion King, you have CGI animals that are made to look photorealistic. Well, photo actual animals don't have very expressive faces unless they're snarling. So you lose all of the emotion that the cartoon version had, and that kind of happens what am I talking about? It's got nothing to do with this. That is sort of similar with the Jafar. In the animated cartoon of Aladdin, Jafar was very menacing and big eyes and, you know, gnashing pointy teeth. And in this, the guy's a little bit lower key. He's a bad guy, clearly, but it di he didn't quite work for me. But the two leads were great. Uh, Will Smith is fine doing what he does. It's the same songs as the previous film. It's really pretty much the movie you remember from as a cartoon, but done in live action. Um, it was fine to me. I guess, I saw it, it was okay, but I, the whole time I'm watching it, I'm thinking the original. And it's one of those things where, if you have a kid who hasn't seen Aladdin, the original cartoon, it's still gonna work. It's still gonna work fine. The same with Dumbo, Beauty and the Beast, Lion King. If you show any kid those cartoons, they're, they're probably gonna work fine. So I don't know the need other than that to remake these. There's no artistic need at all to remake these. It's just a cash grab.
Disney ran through all the animated things they could make, and then they decided to just start remaking all the animated films in live action. Some might be good, some might be less, but it, to me, it's just a waste. It's like, you know, you could, you could probably put those back in theaters again. You probably wouldn't make as much money, but it would be easier money, I would think. Anyway, my beefs aside, uh, this Aladdin was fine. If you like the original, it's certainly worth seeing to see what you think of this live action version. Uh, if you haven't seen the original, this is an animated movie about uh, Arabia and the genie. Should work for you fine. It's I, Really, I didn't have much of a problem with this movie. It's just one of those things where it's been a couple of months since I've seen it, and I haven't really thought about it much since then. And when I think, when I think back about it, I have fleeting memories of it just being okay. You know, it was, I don't know if that, that quote will get me on the box cover. How do you type out? So, speaking of sequels and remakes and properties from the 90s, we have uh, the latest sequel to a film series that, speaking of Will Smith, there's the secret connection. For those of you following at home, there's always a secret connection between two movies here. I don't know what they are until I say them, but apparently the secret connection this week is Will Smith. And he and Tommy Lee Jones starred in a series of films about men who wore black suits and shades and who eradicated aliens from our planet to keep the world safe from invaders and evildoers and things like that. Well, that series ran its course. Uh, they were pretty good, I thought. The third one actually was rather touching. And now we have another film. We've dropped the numbers. We're sort of starting over again with a new cast, younger and hotter, as I say. Always cast younger and hotter. And we have Chris Hemsworth and, uh, don't want to get her name wrong, Tessa Thompson, who's been in many, many things, including the Creed films. And uh, they are the new people who wear black suits. And they are fighting uh, aliens around the world, shall we say. And we have uh, Emma Thompson as their boss, and we have Liam Neeson also as one of their bosses. And then you have Camille Nijani as the voice of one of the aliens who hooks up with them. And this is Men in Black International. So I did some DJing last weekend and the weekend before at the Mahoning Drive-In Theater in Lahaiden, Pennsylvania, and it was interesting. I'm used to yapping on TV. I'm used to doing this. I'm very, very comfortable doing this. I'd never done DJing before. It's just your voice, you know? And I realized that as motor mouth as you think I might sometimes be on this show, when you're doing TV, you can just, you can do that. When you're doing radio, you really can't. People think their radio went off. You have to keep talking. And it was an interesting skill. It was an interesting thing to, uh, to try out. And I loved it. I loved it a lot. Uh, that's, I'm, I'm a little rambly, I'm a little tired. Anyway, so, Men in Black International. That's why we're here, right? Yeah. I was not excited about this film when it came out. It looked fine to me. I was never a huge fan of the Men in Black. It was the kind of thing that I would go to see. I say movies are like bubblegum for a lot of people. They, uh, it's great while the flavor lasts and then the flavor's gone, you take it out, you discard it, and you don't think about it again. That's kind of what the Men in Black movies were like for me. I would see them as they came out. They were very fun and entertaining, and then I just never thought about them again. So this sort of came at me as another one of those. I'm like, oh cool, they're doing another one of those with different people. Let's see what we have to, what do we have to work with here? And um, I thought it was fine. It was entertaining while I watched it. Again, I could tell you very little about this film. I do recall that, once again, as soon as I saw a certain character, I'm like, that's gonna be the bad guy. <laughs> and I was right. Uh, I'm no Sherlock Holmes. It was just, it was, you see enough movies, you can kind of see the, the telltale signs of the character types that turn out to be the bad guy. Or bad lady. I'm not gonna give anything away. Um, the leads were fine. Tessa Thompson's fine. She's British. She's doing a full American here. She's been in a lot of stuff. She's generally quite good. Chris Hemsworth's charming and funny. He plays a good, you know, good looking sort of doofus most of the time, and that, that works for him here. Um, everybody in it is fine. The effects are good. Uh, the international flavor I thought was cool. It's a good way to, to freshen up a, a series. And I've, I've thought that about a lot of film series. I mean, the Bond series was always great about that. They were always set around the world. They were globetrotting adventures and it kept it interesting. Those were made in an era where people didn't see the rest of the world quite as often in the way those films gave them. You can't just, you know, click on a webcam and look at a beach like now, like you could then, then like you could now. Um, so, the idea of taking something that's pretty squarely set in this country and throwing it into Europe or something, cool. Like, I'm, I'm up for several movies that do that because I do like seeing other parts of the world and other cultures and other weapons somebody could grab off a wall that you wouldn't find in a bar in Tucson, you know what I mean? So uh, the international sty flavor stylings look great, the locations look good, the effects were fine, so it was fun. This is, um, 
Again, I always go back to the drive-in. This is a fun co-feature at the drive-in. That's not how you're gonna see it now, but that's kind of the tier I put this on. A fun rental, however you do that now. Um, it, this is nothing I could see myself owning or probably willingly watching again. That's not an insult. It's just, it wasn't that spectacular to me, but while I was watching it, and drinking my Dr. Pepper and eating my buttered popcorn and popping those Junior Mints, which is a nice combination, by the way, if you've never done that. It sounds gross, not in the same, not your mouth at the same time, that is gross, but if you have a little buttered popcorn, you get that buttery, salty flavor, you pop a Junior Mint in with the, the mint and the chocolate, it's really good. Just alternate, you can thank me later. So, Men in Black International, it was fine, it was fine. Um, that won't get in a, book, a box cover either. So, now, a film. Okay, here's one that I really did like. This is one that I saw in theaters. This wasn't a very wide release. This actually did play here at the Colonial in Keene. It's a small, I'm not sure if this was A24. This is a smaller like indie film. So it didn't play every, every, everywhere, but it's coming to video, which makes it every, every, everywhere. And to me it is highly worth checking out. This is the feature film debut from Olivia Wilde, who you may know from such films as Cowboys and Aliens or Good Movies. She's been in a lot of stuff. And uh, it's about two youths two uh, female high school seniors who are A students, straight shooters, never went to a party, never did anything inappropriate. They went to school every day, perfect attendance, high grades. They're going to a college, but they realize something was missing. They find out that the kids who did party, the kids who did screw around all the time, the kids who did get expelled occasionally, they're also getting into those big colleges because they did well in their classes too. And that's not fair to these two girls. So they decide they're gonna go out and hit the biggest party, the biggest end of the year senior blowout they can and have fun, the fun they weren't having for four years uh, because they were book smart. I loved this movie. This was one where I saw the trailer and I was like, mm, I, I don't know, it looks like another super bad, which I guess in a way it probably was a female super bad. I don't know, I never saw super bad. I never wanted to. I'm not a fan of the Seth Rogen-y kind of stuff like that. Uh, so it's two girls who decide to go out and, and cut loose and whoop it up and have just a nightmare of a time trying to get successfully to this party, to this place they're trying to get to. And uh, it's crude, it's rude, and it's funny as hell. It's uh, smart and it's got a lot of heart. Am I trying to rhyme everything? No, it's, uh, I just had a thoroughly good time with this movie and I did not expect it. And again, it might be because the expectations were so low that I enjoyed it all that much more, but it's really sharp. It's really, really funny. It, re it does remind me of other things that I've seen, but that's okay because it did things that I hadn't seen before and it made me laugh out loud, which really not a lot of comedies do that anymore. So Booksmart is out on video. I really, really recommend you to see it. It's not one for the kids. Might not be one for grandma. Unless grandma is a little, you know, she hits a few. But anyway, up next, speaking of hitting a few, we have the latest installment, latest chapter, literally, in the, uh, don't roll the clip, in the, Don, in the John Wick saga. Keanu Reeves is back once again to just really kill a whole lot of people. Just a whole lot of shots fired, a whole lot of mags emptied. Just really, really a lot of people get killed in this movie. So you had John Wick where bad guys break into his house, this ex-assassin's house, and they kill his dog. And the dog was given to him by his wife who just passed away. It was the last thing he had of her. And that's the last straw. And he unearths, he unearths the, the vault of guns and he just lays waste to these bad guys. And then you have chapter two where uh, the brother of the guy he killed goes after him. And there's a whole lot more killing and it was fantastic. And now you have this one where all of the bad guys kind of in the world are trying to kill John Wick and he's just trying to survive in John Wick chapter three, Parabellum. These, I love these movies. I've loved all three of these movies. I went to a screening at the Alamo Draft House Yonkers where I spend a lot of my time and they ran all three back to back. So it was the first two and then it was the premiere of the third one. It was fantastic. It's action that you can see. It's dynamically choreographed action. It's gorgeously shot action. If you've seen the trailer, the color and the style, these are incredibly stylish. First of all, just an action movie where you can see what the hell's going on is a revelation these days, and all three have had that, which is fantastic. The level of mayhem is insane. This is like prime 90s Hong Kong movies with gasoline and a match thrown on top of them. Um, the cast is fantastic. You get various A-listers who show up. You have Ian McShane, you have Halle Berry, you have Lawrence Fishburne in there. You had Franco Nero in the previous, which was great for me. And uh, you, you just have <laughs> creative ways of, of 
people being killed, frankly, and dogs and horses and motorcycles. The, my favorite part in the whole movie is this fight spills into this weapons museum. And there's this scene of these guys just throwing all these bladed weapons at each other as quickly as they can grab them out of cases. And it's ridiculous and hilarious and brutal as anything. Now, uh, this it picks up right where the last one left off. You could ed edit these three movies into one long movie so far, excuse me. And uh, I will say that it does leave a carrot dangling for one more. I hope they do one more. I hope they do one more and maybe call it a day because you don't want to make you don't want to make w one sequel too many. You don't want to make the one that sucks. And then everybody thinks of the great ones and then they're like, oh yeah, and then there's that fourth one. So hopefully they cap it at four and that's it. But this has, to me, revitalized Keanu Reeves as like an action hero, obviously, but also just as a cinematic presence. He's so good in these. I mean, he's, I mean, he's Keanu Reeves. He's low key and he just, he knows how to do the choreography. He learned it in the Matrix and he's not, never forgotten it. It's, it's a bullet ballet, as it were. So, um, it's very funny at times, it's extremely brutal, it's gorgeous to look at. These are movies that as soon as I see them, I immediately wanna buy the highest quality home video version I can and just watch them every few months or years. Excuse me, I had a big lunch. So uh, John Wick chapter three, it's out Tuesday and I cannot recommend any action movie more highly than that since John Wick chapter two for me. Okay, one more left. We'll see if we can squeeze this one in. This is a new zombie comedy from indie director Jim Jarmusch. It stars a bunch of people you know. It's called The Dead Don't Die, and here's the clip. Yeah. When I watched this film in the theater, I thought back to the opening credits, and I thought, it was a long time ago, wasn't it? This was not good for me. I saw this in a theater, surprisingly crowded theater. This is an indie Horror comedy, Jim Jarmusch is known as very, a guy who makes very quirky independent films, kind of sort of art house independent sort of comedies, dramas and stuff. So I knew this wasn't gonna be a normal movie. This wasn't gonna be another zombie land, but it's just so low key and so slow and boring and aggressively not funny. And these running gags that just aren't funny. And the zombie stuff is, there's a sequence toward the end, there's a lot of zombie killing if that's what you're into, but otherwise it's just trying to be funny and wasn't for me. And uh, there's this meta moment at the end that I was like, <laughs> That was really funny in 1968 when the monkeys did it, but this not, no, no. So I really kind of hated The Dead Don't Die. A lot of horror fans don't like it because they're expecting a zombie land and they're getting a Jim Jarmusch movie. I don't know what Jarmusch fans think of it. If you're a Jim Jarmusch fan and you saw The Dead Don't Die, what did you think of it? Because I know some people really like this movie, but for me, um, I just want to warn you basically. I've talked about it again to warn you, it's not what it looks like. If you take a chance on it, just be aware that it's not quite what it looks like. So um, we are running rapidly out of time next week in theaters. We have The Goldfinch and Hustlers. I'll be seeing one of those at least in the theater. And on video we have Dark Phoenix, yeah, Dark Phoenix and The Hills Have Eyes too. And then I'll probably fill the time with other stories of what I did on my summer vacation or something like that because four movies does not an hour make unless they're really fascinating movies. And uh, these are not fascinating movies. So did I ever tell you about the time that uh, Flavor Flav was on a plane with me coming back from Vegas? Uh, it was really crazy. He had the we're out of time. So I will tell you some other time about the time that Flavor Flav was on a plane with me from Vegas. He had the clock and everything. I am Mark, I am the Cinemaniac, and I will see you at the movies.